Welcome back to Sage Advice. I'm Rivka Rivera. I'm the Associate Director at the Flobel Foundation. And today we have a very special guest, Flobel Advisor, Glenn Reynolds. Glenn has over 25 years in the indie film business. He's produced, executive produced, and co-produced 20 films and sold over 500 films. Glenn is the founder and CEO of Circus Road Films, a company whose mission is to provide clear, honest, strategic advice to independent filmmakers and to champion their work to the industry. Circus Road Films guides filmmakers through the festival and distribution process and negotiates distribution licensing agreements on their behalf. In its first 12 years, Circus Road has participated in the sales of over 700 narrative and documentary feature films, with many films premiering at Sundance, Slamdance, South by Southwest, Tribeca, Los Angeles Film Festival, Toronto, and many other prominent festivals. Distributors of their films include Fox, Sony Universal, Lionsgate, Magnolia, IFC, Oscilloscope, Draft House, Image, Anchor Bay, HBO, Showtime, Stars, Lifetime, ESPN, and Sci-Fi. So without further ado, welcome, Glenn. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to have you. So you founded Circus Road Films in 2006. Can you just tell us what your inspiration to do so was and a little bit about your history? How did you get sure. into Sure. Yeah, so I, um, my first 10 years in the business, I worked for other companies doing all, all sorts of things. I started, you know, even further back, I, I, I started out trying to be an actor for two minutes, and then I um, decided to go to law school, got out of law school and decided I want to get back in the entertainment business. So I came out here to Los Angeles, and I got a job with a sales company, a film sales company, um, and we were selling films around the world. So I learned everything there from, uh, I started doing business affairs, I did acquisitions, finding films. I helped start produ producing the films, selling the films, marketing the films, so everything. And then about 15, 16 years ago, I just wanted to do something by my, you know, on my on my lonesome, and um, and started looking at the world of so-called producer reps, which are people that specialize in selling U.S. rights for indie films, and thought that well, there's there's a lot of agencies that do it for bigger independent films. But I felt like there was kind of room for someone to do it well in the in the um, in the true indie film space. You know, the films that are really you know made with spit and tape and uh, <laughs> someone's dentist's money, as opposed to being financed by international sales agents, bigger independent films. And um, so I put out my shingle. I built a website, and and I'm still doing it um, wow. 15, 16 years later. So producers rep, I want to just get into that a little bit more because I think yeah. that's something that filmmakers and artists might be unfamiliar with, but it sounds like it's kind of a crucial thing. At what point are you going to engage with a producer's rep and who who is that right for? Right. It might depend on the producer rep. In my case, um, I'm usually brought on either pre-festival or just post-festival run. Or, or if there's no festival involved, I, I come in right when the film is done. Um, so because I've gotten no programmers over the years, I sometimes act as an advocate to the festivals to try to help people get into the festivals as part of the strategy towards selling a film. Um, but sometimes I come across films after they've already done five or six festivals or one big festival and come on at that point. So there's a couple of different touch points when I could come on, but it's usually after the film is done. There's a Occasionally, someone brings me on early to kind of advise during production, but that's pretty rare. It's overwhelmingly mostly once a film film is finished. I think the best way to describe a producer rep um, is it's really someone who specializes in, in selling U.S. distribution rights as opposed to selling films overseas. And the reason you can't be a producer rep to the world is because I don't act as a middleman. I don't get I don't take the film from the filmmaker the assets the film itself and the marketing materials and then go make a sale and then collect that money and then report to the filmmaker that's mm -hmm. international sales agents kind of have to do that because selling to the world is more baroque than selling just U.S. rights mm -hmm. so I'm able to just make a connection between the filmmaker and the distributor so they can deliver directly to them and they can be paid directly 
That's the biggest difference between a producer rep and an international sales agent. I can be, a, I'm a little bit more lean um, in terms of like my, my staff and, and, and what I do in terms of the back end. But in addition to that, you know, I have the legal background, so I can kind of help a little bit with contracts. I have the festival advocacy part. And then I also try to cast myself a little bit as a consultant, a distribution consultant. I've learned a thing or two about distribution over the years. So I try to people, help people understand what distribution is, who the, who the good players are in the business, you know, what, what, how you can supplement your distribution if someone's taking your film out. So I try to, I think of myself as kind of producer rep plus. Um, but basically at its essence, producer rep is selling us rights. Yeah. The plus I saw on the website, there's representation, film festival advocacy, business affairs, services, management, hybrid and theatrical distribution, script and project analysis. Um, and sometimes you co-produce films as well or produce films. I know that you have a lengthy experience as a producer, so at what point, if I'm um, a filmmaker and I have a film, at what point, like, how does one get involved with you? Are they approaching you? Are you scouting films as well? What is that process? The little, so I, um, I'd say probably about 70, 75% of my films are referred to me either by agencies that, that see a film and they think it's just too small for them, no big name, so they're not really, they don't really sure what to do with it. Um, and then just old clients, people I know in the business, other people that do something similar to what I do, I get referrals a lot. So that that's very helpful. Um, in addition, I have someone that does a little research for me on films and festivals to see if they, things pop out to me. Um, and then we do a little bit of reaching out. And then I'd say, and that's probably like 10% of the films, and another 15% I'd say are people that just come across me they Googled producer rep or, um, or found me somehow on some list somewhere and, and contact me directly. And they can, you know, my email, I'm pretty open. People, I'm not, there's not a big firewall to contacting me. I, people can email me or call me. Is there something that you look for in films that you're like, this is something that I think I can work with that I think has a lot of potential? I mean, and I'm guessing, you know, your background as a producer, as an as an all around artist, having had acting experience, probably comes into play there. What are you looking for? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm certainly um, ultimately I want films that moved me in some way, made me laugh or scared me or you know made me cry or you know like something that affected me. Um, I think that's just kind of a natural subjective reaction. If you have that kind of reaction to a movie, that's, you know, it's a, it's a hint that other people will have that same reaction and that it's, there's some quality there. Um, and there's a lot of little things that go into that, you know, that make a, a, a good movie from production value to how well it was shot, to how well it was written, how good the actors are, how good the direction is, you know, just tons of things that make that, you know, one little piece falls out and the whole thing crumbles. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for good movies, um, and that's kind of a subjective thing. Um, I th and I think, fortunately, I think, I think as you do this for a number of years, your, your taste kind of aligns with what's commercial to a certain degree. Um, and, um, and though there are some you know, fairly uncommercial films I've, I've kind of figured out something for, but it's, it's not, you know, certainly it's, it's a little, um, I mean, I, I, I don't want my job to be hard. Um, but sometimes it is because I'm dealing with something that like, you know, maybe is, you know, well acted, well shot and well written, but the, you know, it's limited locations because it's low budget. And so there's not a lot of scope to it. And sometimes the bigger distributors really want, you know, they really want things to compete with their big indie films. Mm. So it's really, it's kind of a tough, it's a tough road. And certainly I've had films that compete at that level, but I've had films that, you know, that were we're going with kind of smaller or mid-sized distributors as well. Hmm. And when you're consulting, I'm guessing you've met many indie film directors, probably ranging from first time to directors who've been doing it for years. What would you say, is there sort of a general advice that you give people in the first hand or something that you see that people often stumble upon that you would advise them on? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of things. Um, 
you know, with first time filmmakers, you know, it kind of depends on where in the process we're talking. There's so many films I see where I just say, I wish you had, you know, gone through 10 more rewrites, you know, mm -hmm. of the script. there's a lot of films I see where I think you should have, you know, Hey, you, ha you have it there, but you should have, um, you should have shown some friends or you, know, you should have had some focus groups, watch it, you know, even, even informal ones just to get other people's eyes on it. Mm. Um, that's something I think a lot of first time filmmakers don't do, which is I think a handy tool that, you know, studios do it, bigger companies do it. There's a reason because, you know, you want to, you want, you want your movie to appeal to the public. You got to kind of feel what the reactions are. And um, I just don't think people do that enough. Um, I think people should do their due diligence when they're looking for someone like me to rep their film. They shouldn't go with the first person that comes across their, their email and says, hey, we'd love to distribute your movie or we'd love to sell your movie. Um, you should try to find lists of producer reps and sales agents and distributors and do a little, you know, call people that have worked with them and find out a little bit more before you kind of jump into that, into that world. Because there's, you know, there's not everybody has your best interest at heart. Um, you need to find someone that really connects to the movie and really, um, you know, has a track record of doing it properly. Um, I think those are the main things, I think, in terms of, you know, where I sit. Yeah, and I think the world of once you get into that sort of the world of festivals and distribution can probably be, I mean, I think a lot of filmmakers are not, they're just not thinking about that necessarily while they're making the film, nor should you necessarily, nor should you necessarily. However, I imagine once they get to that phase, I mean, when you first start learning about the that film festivals themselves are an actual business, right? So you're not, it's not right. necessarily just, oh, I apply and then, you know, like any kind of big, uh, colleges are the same way. It's, like, you it's know, sure. like, oh, right. Turns out you don't just apply and everyone has an equal shot. Right. What do you think are some of the things that people are sort of get wrong about film festivals off the bat or have to have that early learning curve on? Yeah, I think for one, I think sometimes people start submitting too early in the process. They get to that rough cut stage and they say, oh, this is good enough. You know, they'll see the quality. And it's just, you need to put your best foot forward, I think. Um, and given the odds of getting into these film festivals, I mean, it's just crazy the number of film festivals being, the number of films that are applying and the number they take. And then you look at some of the bigger film festivals, a lot of those film festivals are taking very, you know, very Hollywood indie films. You know, right. films made with stars that were maybe they're, they're independent because they weren't made with a studio, but they were made with, you know, financing from international sales. You know, they managed to get, you know, big, you know, somewhat big stars attached. Um, that group, they think of themselves as independent and rightly so in a way. They don't have U.S. distribution. There's That's a competitive world as well. Those guys are competing for Magnolia and IFC. And yeah, well, well, can you break that down a little? Because I think that is something that that can be confusing and almost jargony now, this idea of independent yeah. film, right? We have like sort of an idea, but it feels like that term itself has been co-opted to, to the point yeah. of thinking. Well, I kind of, you know, I used to be very um, jaded about Hollywood independent films using the term independent because sure. I come from true independent worlds. It's like, you know, you don't, it's not, but you know, the more you learn about it, you, the more you realize that they have it hard too. Like when a, there, there are a lot of films made um, by, by Hollywood producers based in Hollywood that, um, that are either international sales agents themselves and they're both production and sales or independent, and they're making them in conjunction with uh, international sales companies. And they're trying to make films in a, you know, $3 million plus range. I mean, and even more and more, five, 10 plus. Mm. And when they do that, that, in order to justify the budget, they need a certain level of name in the movie so that when they go out and pre-sell it to territories around the world, um, they go to a German distributor and say, hey, we've got Kevin Bacon in a $3 million film. Will you pay, will you give us a contract that says, um, 
give us, you know, $300,000 upon delivery of the film to you. And it's a regular distribution contract where they'll take it out and do all that things. But it's a contract that you can take to a bank and they get money for, mm-hmm. um, or a certain portion of that money for. And so international sales agents go around and make these sales. And then there's still a gap left over. There's still a need for equity. There's still a need for doing something in a state with incentive. It's not like you can pre-sell the world. So it's a very complicated, somewhat complicated structure compared to just getting your your family to give you, you know, 50,000 to make a movie. It's just a totally different uh, world. But that world is competitive. Like there's a lot lot of movies being made that don't see the light of day in U.S. distribution, that, that we're trying to get to a place where they'd be at Sundance or Toronto or wherever, but don't make it and, and don't have um, anybody in that team that wants to put forward the, the monies towards doing a big theatrical. So go, they end up selling it straight to an HBO or a Showtime or something like that, but those numbers don't add up to it being a financial success, those, you know, Showtime and HBO and those guys barely need anything because they're making their own movies um, as well right. and their own series. So there's very, you know, few outlets now, even if, even for that, that true independent world. So there's a lot of failure there. There's a lot of films that just don't make back what they, what the investment was. Um, and here we are as true independents from the, just, you know, putting it together with an investor you know, some friends and putting your film together and you come to this, you're coming to the same place there. You're, you're side by side with them going into Sundance and you're side by side with them talking to Lionsgate and all the various distributors of, of content to say, Hey, take our film. And is Lionsgate, what do they want the Kevin Bacon thriller that's made for $3 million or do they want your hundred thousand dollar drama? Mm. You know, it's pretty, that's, it's a really a no brainer for mm-hmm. for Lionsgate they and they don't really have to pay a lot to get the Kevin Bacon movie either mm-hmm. um I mean maybe it's great maybe it's a good movie I don't want to slam Kevin Bacon <laughs> Kevin Bacon's a great actor you know does great, a lot of great work and maybe all his movies make money but the the point is is that as a true independent it's just it's difficult and so I, I that's why I I have started calling true independent as opposed to Hollywood independent that's that's the way I kind of break down that's a really helpful that's a really helpful distinction and I think you just clarified a lot for me and I'm sure people watching about what that world is because it's true I think anyone paying attention to any kind of media when you look at HBO you're like where did all these what yeah this, this person did this movie I mean it seems endless and also <laughs> overwhelming and so when you're saying just for further clarification when you're saying um a hollywood independent film is or i guess a true independent film whichever way but if they're not getting u.s distribution but if is hbo like if i sell to hbo max let's say that's not that's international that's not u.s that wouldn't be considered u.s distribution well, it's a form of U.S. distribution. So I I present films when I present films to the U.S. market. I go to the platforms like Netflix, HBO, and Sh- HBO Max, and Got Showtime, it. et cetera, to see if I can sell to them. But I also go to all rights distributors. You know, on the top side, Magnolia and IFC, theatrical companies, um, Lionsgate, um, and then I want to you know mid sized straight to digital companies like vertical and gravitas that some do some films theatrical and some films straight to digital so i go to a kind of a, a you know different kinds of company for u.s distribution and you know true independence and hollywood independence can go to that world just the same once it's done they're going to present to the same people so it sounds like a big part of your expertise is like your matchmaking a little bit is that fair to say yeah yeah a little bit yeah although i'm 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 definitely on the uh, on the in the filmmaker's side of the matchmaking right, right, right. process, like I'm right. their advocate. Um, Let's trying get to you get the right prints. <laughs> yes, exactly. Got it. <laughs> but I'm. But I guess what I mean by that is you must be because you've worked with all of these. You your expertise is these all the places you listed, all the different places to distribute. You might be thinking the calculus of I'm familiar with this film and what's in it and all of the 
all of the pieces you said, it might have really great acting and directing, but fewer locations. And so I'm guessing part of what you're putting together is where would that be a right fit? Yeah, and I'm definitely trying to set expectations with the filmmakers when they when I watch the film and say yeah. like, okay, here's where I'm going to try. Here, here's this 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 group of companies is a long shot. These guys are right in your wheelhouse, and we'll make a match there, no problem. But let's see if we can get even better. Um, you know, same thing with festivals. There's some films I watch and I think we sh we should skip trying for Sundance. It's just not it's not going to happen. You have a good movie. But the odds for Sundance are, cra are crazy for your kind of film. We should either go right to buyers or we should start with a smaller festival um, that might have a better odds for taking your movie. Um, so yeah, that's definitely part of the process is, you know, and if I, if I feel like a filmmaker, if I can detect a little um, hubris there or a little like, you know, if they're a little starry eyed, um, I'm a little reticent to get in, in, into the deal because I don't want to go out and not get what they want and for them to think why couldn't he get me a, a large theatrical deal because some people just have the blinders on with the with regard I mean we all do when we make a movie we all we're all in love with our our baby and yeah. there's nothing wrong with our baby it's the most beautiful baby that was ever born yeah and why shouldn't everybody love it and think it's the most beautiful baby you know so yeah. you just have to fill that out so talking more about festivals, I mean, there's so many, it feels like they're just, as soon as you get on like film freeway or anything like that, yeah. it's just a Every whole, suburb has three film festivals, you know. It's, it's, and they're all charging you to, you know, it's a business right. now. It's a whole right. thing. Um, is it worth, I guess, I guess this is a dependent on where you're at in your career, but like, are there just, are there things that you would suggest in a filmmaker who's searching for festivals independently, like, are there any red flags or are there things you would say to look for, you know, because I think it can be, if you don't have any knowledge of that or haven't done it before, it kind of all looks the same sometimes on the, on the websites, you know? Yeah, for sure. And well, there's, I mean, film freeway is a pretty good service for, I don't know if you know about that, but film freeway has become, you know, there used to be without a box, but film freeway really right. kind of nudged it out of the business. And, um, it's a pretty great resource for researching festivals um, and applying to festivals. So I recommend everybody kind of start there. Um, there are a couple of film festivals that don't use it, which is crazy, but um, you know, and this those are usually kind of obvious, but, um, but um, within, I mean, first of all, like I, I definitely have my, I've been to tons of festivals. I've got no programmers. I kind of, I know which ones are, are well run and um, not just trying to get you to buy advertising in their program, um, which is, you know, there's some, there's some festivals out there that are just kind of, um, you know, in it totally to get your dollars, you know, that's just, it's all, that's all it's about. Not that they all are doing that. They ever, it's, you know, it's capitalism. So everybody's trying to make, uh, make money, but there's some that just are, are you know, just not that well run. Um, you know, one way to, if you don't have someone like me on Film Freeway, there, there are things on there where they have like a hundred best reviews, reviewed uh, film festivals. Um, and that's a good, that's a good place to look. Um, I tend to try to look at festivals that have been around for 10 years plus, and they have that information in Film Freeway, how long they've been around. Um, if you've been around two years, you know, there's probably not much of an audience base there. Um, yeah. You may have, you may be well intentioned and trying to run a great festival, but there's so many festivals that have been around for 20, 30, 40 years um, that are well run that you know know how to handle filmmakers, know how to have good parties, Q and A's, good theaters, you know, those kind of things. So I think it's it's looking for those festivals that have been around for a long time is probably the best um, best indicator. Mm. and do you have favorite festivals I mean I'm sure there's the obvious ones but are do you have some favorite since you've been to so many do you have any favorite festivals that people might not know about yeah um I really like Woods Hole in Massachusetts really great little festival really well run great programmers great staff um just a really really fantastic festival 
you know, I, I feel like festivals for like, I, I've been going to Sundance for 25 years and I still love going. Um, um, I love South, I mean, they're kind of the big ones so that like mm -hmm. South by Southwest. I once had a film in Telluride, which I don't go to very often, but that was a, um, and it's kind of, it's kind of a, a big one, but it's kind of a secret one at the same time. It's kind of a strange, mm -hmm. it's always, it only has big films and it's right before Toronto. Um, and industry is heavily industry attended um, and Telluride turns out for it, but it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's not terribly independent minded because they don't really care about, they just care about good movies. They don't care about it being independent per se. There's, uh, uh, there's one in Los Angeles called Film Invasion, um, which is very small, but um, I love the programmer gotten to be friends with him over the years i think he does a great job programming and he's, he's definitely a guy who has it not in it for the money he's doing it for the love of the of the um it's a nonprofit, and it's a very he does it in a little theater in sherman oaks oh, cool. um and just, he's really got a good eye for stuff but um yeah that's another one i'd say it's kind of a hidden gem amazing so as someone who's been attending sundance for 25 years and in this business for a long time are there, where, what would you have to say about sort of where in the state of independent film currently? I mean, we got into it a little bit, but, um, and I know that you sort of, you kind of came over to be more optimistic, but what are your thoughts on just, you know, where, where film is at currently? I know that's a big question, but whatever yeah, thoughts yeah. you have. <laughs> yeah, it's hard because, um, I go, I, I definitely go up and down in my opinion of this stuff because maybe it uh, depends on the day you catch me. Um, yeah. How I roll out, roll out of bed that day because it's always been tough. Like it's just never like, except for the early days in the nineties when the uh, cable was new and HBO needed films, didn't make anything themselves. And we had video stores and DVD stores that needed product in a big way um that was when you could go out and make el mariachi and clerks and films at a budget like that and and have this i mean i'm sure they didn't have a, any expectation of busting into the business they just did it for the love of it to a certain degree with a little bit of hope but um there was room for that then and i don't know that there's room for that now the big film out of you know Sundance this year is Coda. Right. You know, um, millions of this is a yeah. you know not, again not a big film. It's Hollywood independent, but you know one of the producers is the producer of Twilight. You know they knew how to put this thing together. Mm -hmm. They probably have people that are investing in it. They're investing in multiple movies, so that the risk is amortized. It's just not the same as having a. It's not like Brick, which was made for you know, half a million dollars with friends and family money right. um, or, you know, e you know, or Mirachi, even less. I just, and I, and I see films that I, on, on, in my world that I feel like, wow, if this, if this had, if this film was in 1998 um, or even the early 2000s, there would be room for it to break out at Sundance. And it still might get into Sundance, but, it, and it still might get some kind of deal but even, even then, even some of the films that get those IFC and Magnolia deals, those guys only have a couple of films a year that pop out a little yeah. bit beyond it. And so um, it's, it has gotten tougher. But every year I think, you know, like, will I have a business next year? I've been thinking that for 15 years. Mm. You, know? you know, everybody's been talking about the demise of independent film, but people still go out and make them regardless. Yeah of of the market and um and maybe that's because they just have no sense of the market when they, you know you're talking about how they don't you know filmmakers don't know distribution they, they don't know the odds like i know the odds and maybe if they did they would go and make youtube yeah, maybe content. it's a good thing <laughs> yeah maybe i guess it kind of depends on their you know you know if i the little chat i would have with them before the process if i could with every one of them would be just make your if you're getting someone to invest money into you just make sure that they know the odds right that they that you're being honest with them and you've done your do try to do your due diligence about like what it's really like to to 
spend 50, 100, $200,000 on a movie. Like mm-hmm. what, what usually happens with those films? Because overwhelmingly, most of these films are making thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. It's so pretty rare that they can make that little HBO deal or Showtime deal or get a little theatrical that pops it a little bit. Those are those are unicorns these days. Um, so it's uh, it's definitely a mixed positive and negative message for, for me. Yeah, I think that sounds absolutely accurate, and yet it's amazing. It, I, I love, there's something very optimistic about, but I've been saying this for 15 years or having that feeling for, you know, and so you've obviously stayed in this business and it's happening and films are being made. Um, so, I mean, that's wonderful. I guess my last question would be, um, is there any value, is there any kind of alternative to distribution? Like, is there any kind of self-distribution that's worthy or do you see any kind of, potential new ways do you see any of that bubbling up in the industry and yeah. is that what we're looking at so i found you know that um the answer is yes but you you probably need some money for it you probably need to save some of your budget for distribution probably more and you, you're going to need to bring in at least a couple of experts, a couple of people to, to help. It's a pretty rare bird that has the ability to make a really great movie, knows how to handle actors, knows how to handle a camera, figured out the financing of the whole thing. And then also, and all the, just all the skill sets you need just to make a good movie is, is overwhelming, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then you also need to publicize the movie. You need to market the movie. You need to book theaters, you need to know the market. Um, And so I would suggest anybody that's thinking about self-distribution or even so-called hybrid distribution, where you're doing the marketing and someone else is putting on the platforms, that you do a lot of due diligence in terms of publicists and how, what other films have done in that space, because it's it's old it's ultra competitive you're you're as a self distributor you're entering the a world of films that are also being to tr- have traditional distribution and people know what they're doing and you're competing with all you know every week you're competing with 10 theatrical releases and two new netflix films and two new hulu films and two new hbo films and all the series they've released and that's all you're competing with all that content and so i would say that there is um you know, if you make a documentary about a niche subject, mm-hmm. you, you, there's probably a little bit more um, of an opportunity for self-distribution than making a drama about drug addiction or name your, name your subject. Documentaries about a particular subject matter, you can, there are, um, there are some kind of uh, self-distribution gurus out there that can help you understand how to do that. That's not that's not what I do, but um, but there's some legit ones, and especially in that niche, mm. that, that um, go the route of um, advising that you take on partnerships with companies and entities that have common cause with your with the subject matter of your documentary, mm. and then when you when you when you form that partnership, they you put on free screenings for the, those groups and their constituents. And then they agree to help market the movie to a larger group of people within their their universe. And um, there's definitely been some success in those areas, but it definitely takes time and money. And you have to think, you have to be of the mindset that I'm going to distribute my movie for six months to a year. I mean, that's what I'm going to do. I, you can't have a day job and right. do that. It's just, right. you, I mean, or you maybe can have a part-time job and do that, but a full-time job, I think impossible and it doesn't really align with the whole thing of like wanting to get you know if you're if you're really trying to break into hollywood um and get a career making movies outside of the independent world that's definitely not the path either but it does speak to i think one of the things we talked about early on things young filmmakers should be thinking about and i think that's one thing that i hear a lot of you look at a budget you're like there's nothing there for distribution or marketing even if it's just funds set aside to work with circus road films or you know to work with different companies right i think that's something that just 
is so left out early on. You raised all this money and you're like, but you didn't put that in your budget. It's so crucial. Well, and the problem too is people do sometimes set it aside, but then, you know, as the film gets made, they dip into it. You know, it's like, it's like a contingency. It's like, oh, well, we yeah. can use a crane here or something like, oh, I guess yeah. we'll, we'll take the money <laughs> yeah. away from marketing and then put it there. Yeah, it's like saving money when you're an independent contractor for taxes. And you're like, well, yeah. I'll, I'll think. And you're like, no, you won't. You're That's not. Right. That's right. <laughs> well, awesome, Glenn. This was such a lovely conversation. We're so happy to have you as an advisor. Where can people find you and your company if they want to reach out? Probably the best place is my website, which is circusroadfilms.com. That has all my social handles and my cell and my my phone number. Um so if you go there, uh, there's lots of ways to reach me through my website. And I just want to leave everyone with, on your website, you have this great quote, which I'm assuming is where you found the name for your company from, or it has to do with it. But at the end of the day, cinema is an art form being at the same time, a circus, a voyage to our souls, a mirage, and an illusion of life itself. Federico Fellini. I love that. Yeah, I, uh, I was a longtime Fellini fan for one. Um, and when I was trying to come up with the name of the film for, for my company, a friend of mine named his company after the street he grew up on. And I grew up on uh, in London as a kid on a street called Circus Road. And oh, so wow. at the same time, I came across the Fellini quote. And I thought, OK, this is just too, this is all too uh, um, serendipitous. So that's that is awesome. the name. Oh, I love that. Well, thank you so much, Glenn. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks so much. <laughs>